God we serve this morning. Would y'all agree with me? Let's sing. Almighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. If you can just look around you right now and know that. What a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. One more time. What a mighty God we serve. And what a mighty God we serve. Even the angel. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. And he is the lily of the valley, and that's why we worship him. Would you sing with me? An old need about a goodie. The lily of the valley. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley. In him alone I see. All I need to live and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort. In trouble he's my stay. He tells me every that he will take care of us and he promised us that if we live for him he will be with us and we are standing on those promises today 2021 we are standing on those promises on the promises of christ my king through eternal ages let his praises ring glory in the highest i will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing. of God my Savior standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing, 
depending on the promises of Christ the Lord. Bound to Him eternally, love a strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, we're standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing. Standing on the promises of God. That's what we here are to do. Stand on his promises. I'm going to do one more song, Brother Jim. It's called, If We Never Meet Again, This Side of Heaven. I think you might know this. Soon we'll come to the end of life's journey. And perhaps we'll never meet anymore. Clouds ever darken the 
the sky and they say we'll be happy in heaven in the wonderful sweet by and by sing with me if we never meet again this side of heaven as we struggle as we struggle through this world and its strife, there's another meeting place, there's another meeting place, somewhere in heaven, by the side of the river of life, by the side of the river of life, where the charming roses bloom. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful day you blessed us with. We thank you for everyone that's here today that sung and hear, uh, hear a word from you, God. I pray for Brother Jeff. I lift him up to you, and I just pray your spirit would be with him. Lord, today as we are in this place, let us leave this place knowing we've been in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kevin. If you have your Bible this morning, I want to ask you to turn with me to Luke chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at verses 40 through 56 in just a few minutes. Uh, Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. Now, this is another very familiar passage of Scripture in the book of Luke. And last week, we were looking at, at uh, what precedes this right here. And uh, what we find in these verses today, whereas last week we saw two examples of opposition to Jesus, right here we find two great rises that take place in the book of Luke. And uh, these are just, uh, just just a beautiful story when you read this right here. But what had happened last week, if you, if you recall, is Jesus and the disciples had crossed over the Sea of Galilee, gone to the region of the Gerasenes. On the way over, they encountered a fierce storm, which we talked about how that was most likely opposition coming directly from Satan there, stirring up the waters, trying to prevent Jesus from getting to the other side. But when he got to the other side then, they uh, after he had calmed the storm and got to the other side, they encountered a man that was filled with a legion of demons. And so uh, Kevin corrected me on that. I think I told some of them last week that was probably several hundred, but it's actually several thousand demons that this man was uh, possessed with here. So that's a huge number of demons. And so Jesus cast the demons out of the man, put him back in his, his right mind, got him back on order, but then he sent him out to go back out into the region where he had come from to preach the gospel, armed with not much more than his testimony to go out there and to encounter people and to share the, the love of Christ with them. Now, the interesting thing, what we find out a little bit later on, is that when Jesus went back, even though the people of of the Gerasene region had asked him to leave after all that because he had cast the demons into a bunch of pigs they owned and, and they had a big financial loss and everything. So they begged him to leave. They told him they were scared and all this. They thought, what else are we going to lose if he hangs out here? And so he did. He left and uh, he left the man there. The man went preached throughout the region. And then we learn later in the Gospels, though, that when Jesus came back to that region, he received a warm welcome. And uh, as he was there at that time, many people placed their faith in him. So we see how this man's testimony and his work in that area did uh, all produce almost immediate fruit in that situation here. But today, when we look at this, what we find is Jesus and his disciples are now coming back across the Sea of Galilee. They're returning to Capernaum, and as soon as they get there, Jesus has a couple of ministry encounters along the way. So let's begin in verse 40. You listen as I read, or, or you follow along in your copy of God's Word. It says, When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Just then, a man named Jairus came. 
He was the leader in the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house because he had an only daughter about 12 years old and she was dying. While he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years who had spent all she had on doctors and yet could not be healed by any approached him from behind and touched the end of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. Someone did touch me, said Jesus. I know the power has gone out for me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him. In the presence of all the people, she declared the reason that she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house and said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, Don't be afraid, only believe, and she will be saved. After he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning for her. But he said, Stop crying, because she is not dead but asleep. They laughed at him, because they knew that she was dead. So he took her by the hand and called out, Child, get up. Her spirit returned, and she got up at once. Then he gave orders that she be given something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. What a wonderful story that we have right here in God's Word this morning. And what we find in this story are two very different people with very different needs and very different approaches to getting those needs met. However, what we also see is that it took the same action, a risk of faith, to get what they needed. And that's exactly what we see here. And that's what I hope as we go through this this morning that you will see is that we all, at some point in time, need to make a risk of faith. And so let's look at these two folks here, J. Iris and this woman with the, the uh, hemorrhage or the issue of blood. We are never told her name or anything like that. But uh, she holds a prominent place in Scripture right here. So let's look at some, we're going to compare and contrast some things about these two folks here this morning. And the first thing that I want you to see is I want us to take a look at the rank that each of these people had. Look at the rank that each of these people had. Jairus was a man who stood out from the crowd, whereas this woman was just one in the crowd in this situation. Now, Jairus, when we look at this man, he may not have been the, the richest guy in town. He may not have been the, the most prominent person in town, but he was a man who had it all. He was sort of a, a fat cat or a big wig in Capernaum when we look at this. He had a nice home. He had a wonderful family. He was a synagogue ruler, it tells us, or a synagogue leader, it says in Luke's gospel here. But what we have to understand in that is that the synagogue, as, as most of you know, had become the centerpiece of Jewish culture on that local level right there. And it was the house of worship where people gathered on the Sabbath, and it was also the place where boys were instructed in the law throughout the rest of the week. Now I'm talking about little boys that would come there. After you got to a certain age, you know, you went to work. You didn't, uh, about 12 or 13 years old, you went to work. You didn't come to synagogue school every day. You might have gone early in the morning and still learned some, but you went and worked with your father or someone else there in that day and time. But it's the place where little boys were taught the law and taught to read and write and those things. Kind of a school in a sense there. And so when we look at Jairus, he was a layman who was elected to oversee the goings-on of the local synagogue. Now his work would have included overseeing the, the building itself, maintaining pr uh, propriety in the worship time, also appointing those who would read the scriptures and pray. And also he was one who would seek out those who would actually preach for the congregation. They probably didn't call it preaching in that day and time, the teaching part of it, but that was part of his responsibility was to do those things. And so like I said, Jairus was not the, he was not the mayor of Capernaum, but he was definitely a bigwig in the town of Capernaum. Now we're never told anything about this woman. We don't know her origin. And to this day, her name remains anonymous to us. And so we don't have really much information at all about her. So her rank is much lower than what we see with Jairus. 
But let's also consider not just their, their rank, but let's compare the reality that each of these people face. Let's look at this reality or these realities here. When you look at Jairus, understand that his daughter had given him 12 years of delight, whereas the woman's sickness had given her 12 years of distress. Now, we don't, we don't know the nature of the child's illness. That's the part we're not told in that situation. We only know from the scripture that she was indeed dying. We are, however, given the nature of the woman's illness. It says that, that her medical condition, this hemorrhage of blood, is uh, what was going on with her. Now, that was probably caused by some sort of uh, menstrual or uterine disorder or something of that nature. And it caused her, what we need to understand in her situation, is that caused her to be perpetually unclean. Now, Luke is writing to a Gentile audience, and so he doesn't get into a lot of details like that and things, but we know a little bit about the Jews and the place where they lived and all that, and so those are important things in the situation here. And because she was perpetually unclean, any contact she had with someone else would have made them uh, ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. And so she would never have been able to actually worship in the synagogue. She certainly couldn't go to the temple in Jerusalem and worship with these things going on. And the doctors that had treated her had, had left her destitute of resources and none healthier. And so she's not any better off physically in this situation. And it's very likely that because of her condition, she had either never been married or she was probably divorced. So it was a... a difficult situation for this lady and the reality is that while this unnamed woman was seeking life after 12 years of death Jairus daughter was facing death after 12 years of life and in either case though there was no chance of recovery outside of a miracle and that's what what led both Jairus and this woman to seek out Jesus and to take this risk of faith. And so let's look at the risk that each one of them took. Now, as you recall from the two earlier points here, the people probably really respected Jairus while they would have rejected this woman. And when Jairus came to Jesus, he was a man here, like I said, prominent in the community, but he put his reputation on the line and he risked being rejected. Verse 41 says that when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Now we need to remember that, that Jairus was that synagogue leader. He would have no doubt known about the disfavor that Jesus had found among the Pharisees and the other Jews in the area there and the, the teachers of the law. He had also witnessed Jesus' holy anger as it burned toward these religious leaders' stubbornness when they refused to believe there in the synagogue. However, we've also got to remember that because of Jairus' position, he had no doubt seen Jesus heal the man with a shriveled hand. He had probably also, or at least knew people, who had seen Jesus heal the paralytic. He was probably there that night when those four men, or at least four men, came bringing that paralytic on the stretcher and dug through the roof and laid him right out in front of Jesus. He knew, what, what that means is that Jairus knew that Jesus had the power to save people from demons and from disease. And he apparently believed that Jesus could save his daughter from the jaws of death. And so Jairus was willing to put his reputation on the line and put his dying daughter in the hands of Jesus. Now the woman, on the other hand, she risked being revealed and ridiculed. Under normal circumstances, somebody like this lady would have kept to herself. She would have stayed away from other people. She definitely would not have been caught in the middle of a crowd of people because of her medical condition. And the people of her day would have probably regarded someone like her with this medical condition only slightly better than a leper. However, she believed that Jesus could heal her, so she knowingly worked her way through the crowd causing who knows how many people in the crowd to become unclean and, uh, and not able to go and do those things, even though they didn't know it. And to top that, she knew, this lady knew, that to touch Jesus meant to make him ceremonially unclean. That is the hardest word for me to say today. Ceremonially unclean. But she was willing to take the risk. She hoped what she could do is just slip up on Jesus touch his robe 
and then slip away unnoticed by Jesus or the crowd. Now, listen, that illustrates great, great faith on that lady's part. But each of them had to risk. They had to take a risk of faith to get the healing that was needed. But now let's also look finally at the results that each of them got. Now, this is where it really gets good and gets exciting here. As soon as the woman touched Jesus, it says that she sensed that she had been healed. And at the same time, Jesus sensed that that healing power had gone out from him. And immediately he turned around and asked, who touched my clothes? Now, friends, it's, it's very important for us to realize at this point right here that this woman did not catch Jesus off guard. We already know from other passages that we've looked at that Jesus knew the thoughts and the hearts of men. He knew what people were thinking. I guarantee you, before this woman ever came and touched the tassel of his robe there, he knew that she was coming. He knew what this woman was seeking. And he allowed all this to happen. This was not anything where she caught Jesus by surprise. Let me tell you something, friends. You cannot catch God by surprise. You cannot catch Jesus by surprise. He always knows what is going on in these situations. And so she did not catch Jesus off guard. And uh, the woman's worst nightmare, though, in this situation was coming true because she realized immediately that she had been caught in the act. Now, certainly, like I said, Jesus knew who had touched him. And I imagine that within just a couple of seconds, everybody else in the crowd knew who it was that had touched Jesus. Because whereas everybody else is going along with Jesus, here you got this one woman who is sneaking off in the other direction away from Jesus. And so I'm sure that everybody knew very quickly who it was that had touched Jesus. Now, whatever the case, the woman came, she fell at Jesus' feet with fear and trembling, it says, and she confessed everything. She told him, she said, look, I've been hemorrhaging for 12 years. I, I've been unable to get any relief from the doctors. And, uh, and I'm not any better than I've ever been here. But she had heard that Jesus was back in town. And she thought, if, if I could just touch the, the tassel of his robe, I could be well. And my plan was working pretty good until you caught me. And, and I don't blame you, Jesus, or any of you here in the crowd, if you hate me for making you ceremonially unclean, especially without your awareness of it. But let me tell you something. I am glad I took the risk because I am now relieved of my suffering. Let me tell you, it's always worth it to take the risk. And therefore, I'm sure she probably went on to say, I'm willing to accept whatever consequences are deemed necessary. And friends, I'm sure that as she said those things, or and she had to have said those things because Luke, and all the other gospel writers record that, that uh, all this was going on. But I'm sure what happened immediately after all that is this lady no doubt braced herself for the verdict that was going to come from the lips of Jesus who had just healed her. And she looked, and instead of a scornful frown, there's a warm and welcoming smile. And then he says that wonderful word that we find right here. Daughter. Now, now, let me tell you something. We, we just use that word commonly. We talk about our daughters, you know, somebody's daughter, whatever. But I think to that woman in that moment right there, that was probably the most beautiful word she had ever heard come from the mouth of a human being. Now, I know that we look at that and it says, it goes on to say that Jesus said, your faith is healed. You go in peace and be freed from your suffering. But I think for, the, for this woman who had just been healed, I can't imagine anything sounded so sweet to her as that one endearing word, daughter. It's that in that one word. Get this, in that one word, Jesus was saying to her, I love you, you are precious, you are the apple of my eye, you are uniquely special to me, and you are mine. Listen, that is a wonderful, wonderful promise that he, she got in that one word right there. And so you see how 12 years of being secluded from and ostracized by society faded away from this woman's life in one word. It's amazing the power of our words, but it's especially amazing the power of the words of Jesus. And so this woman who had, had come to Jesus for relief, 
But what she really got was a relationship. And that one word, daughter, signified the new relationship that Jesus now had with this woman, saying to her, you have entered into the most intimate type of relationship. You are part of my family now. So she thought that her greatest need was healing for her body, but in truth, what she really needed was healing for her soul. You see, what she got in this was not just healing, but she got acceptance. What a wonderful truth here. However, what we also see is that the healing that had freed the woman, no doubt it frustrated Jairus. Now I imagine when Jairus heard that word daughter, and then these people came to him and said, listen, don't trouble the teacher anymore, your daughter's dead. I imagine that Jairus probably thought, well, what about my daughter, Jesus? And now his desperation is turned into disappointment because at seemingly the same moment that he gives life back to this woman, these folks arrive saying, don't bother Jesus because your daughter just died. And so I can imagine that, that Jairus probably just stared blankly at Jesus and thought, Jesus, I, I thought you were going to heal my daughter. Why, why did we have to tarry along the way? Why couldn't you just give this woman her healing and then move on and get, and get on to my house? Don't you know how important my daughter is to me? I, I am ruined for sure because everybody in Capernaum saw me come running up to you as soon as you got out of the boat over here and I bowed down before you. I've lost everything. I've lost my daughter. I've lost my reputation. And I probably lost my position in the synagogue. But Jesus refuses to listen to the messengers and he says to Jairus, hey, you believed in me enough to come to me. Don't lose heart now. And with that, they leave the crowd behind. They take Peter, James, and John and they enter the house. <coughs> Excuse me. And so when they get there, Jesus throws out the professional mourners. He goes to where the little girl is. He takes her by the hand and he says, loudly it says, child, get up. Now instantly, the little girl wakes up, but not as if she'd been shot back to life in the emergency room. It says she just got up. She got up and she began to walk around just like any normal child would. And Jairus, his wife and the disciples, they were just out of their minds with excitement. But Jesus gives them two commands right here. He says, first of all, give her something to eat. Now, now we look at that and we think, now, what in the world? You know, give her a hug. Give her something to, give her something to eat. Oh, yeah. Because let me tell you what it does. It, it's symbolic of Jesus' compassion and concern for the physical needs as well as these emotional and spiritual and other needs that this little girl had. But it's also to show them that she was restored to complete health. Uh, it reminds me of the story that we read later on after the resurrection when Jesus is on the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee and the disciples come out there and, and they think it's a ghost that they're seeing, but it's the resurrected Jesus and, and he's got fish cooking on the fire and everything. And, and um, he says, do you have anything to eat? And they're, well, they're like, yeah, you got something right there. But they give him a piece of raw fish and he eats it right there in front of them and, and everything. Let me tell you something. Dead people don't need to eat. Dead people don't eat. And, and sick people don't often don't eat. I, I've talked to a lot of people over this last year that have had COVID and, and these things. And one of the number one symptoms that you hear about people is they just completely lose their appetite. But this little girl got up and she ate just like she always would have. So it showed that she was completely restored to full health. But then he goes on to tell them one other thing here. He says, don't tell anyone. <laughs> now he just hollered it out or he said it loudly you know child get up and, and a lot of people there no doubt knew what was going on but he told them don't go out and, and just spread this or broadcast this to everybody out here in the world and we asked why would Jesus say that well friends it's this that Jesus does not want people coming to him for the wrong reasons like I said in the, the story of the lady with the issue of blood that we read back there 
The number one thing that she received was a relationship. And that's what Jesus is looking for. There are a lot of people that come to Jesus looking for other things. They're looking for physical healing. They're looking for uh, comfort from their problems and all this kind of stuff. But what Jesus wants to give people more than anything else is a relationship with Him. And so that's the main reason why He wants them to come. And listen, friends, the only way you're going to encounter that, the only way you're really going to encounter that is to come personally to Jesus. You've got to spend some time with Him, talking with Him, and uh, just letting Him deal with your life and those things. So Jairus got his daughter back, and the woman got her life back, but it was only because each of these folks was willing to take that risk of faith. So what do we learn from all this? Well, there are several things that we, we could look at, but I want to point out just a, a few here. First of all, <clears throat> we learn that Jesus is always more concerned with the needs of people than with keeping the letter of the law or receiving the approval of men. Let me say that again. Jesus is always more concerned with the needs of people than with keeping the letter of the law or receiving the approval of men. When you look at this, Jesus' compassion for the woman and for Jairus and his family far outweighed any concern he had over becoming unclean from touching a, a sick woman or a dead child. That was not the case there. When, where there was or when there was a need to be met, Jesus did not worry about what people thought of him. He just met the need. And that's the way we need to be in our lives. When we see a need, we need to meet it. We need to do best do our best to meet the need, and we just need to trust God with the results, with our protection, with all those other things. But Jesus didn't worry about all those other things like that. He just met the need. Now, the second thing that we see here is that we realize that there are many people in the world who are unwilling to come to Jesus because they fear they are going to lose their standing in the community or their position with their friends. Let me tell you something, friends. I, I, I was listening to a book, an audio book this week, and and uh, Matt Carter addresses this exact issue right here. That there are so many people out here in the world that they think that the world offers them so much greater and so much better things than they can ever have from Jesus Christ. Now we know the truth. Those of us who have been following Christ and know Christ, we know that's not true here. But they think they are going to be giving up something in the world out here, uh, the pleasures and, and uh, the beauty and all this of, of life and, and, and everything to follow Jesus. And in other words, what it amounts to is a lot of people think that Jesus is kind of prudish. And, and we know that is simply not the truth. When we look at the Gospels, we can see that for sure. And those of us that have been following Him and get to know Him know that's not the truth. But in this situation here, what we have to understand is that they fear, Jairus feared that he might lose his standing or his reputation in the community or his position with his friends but he decided it was a risk worth taking, so he, re he risked being rejected, and he begged Jesus for help. Now, one other thing that we learn here is that uh, many people will never come to Jesus because they are afraid that their real self will be exposed. Let me say that one again. They are afraid to come to Jesus because they are fearful that their real self will be exposed. And so we see, despite this woman's efforts to be unnoticed, she was exposed. There's no way to hide those things. There's no way to hide from God. There's no way to hide from Jesus in these situations. But what she found, what the woman found, was not anger, but acceptance. And so if we will just let go of those things and not worry about that, we will find the same thing. Jesus is an accepting Savior. And so we have to understand that. Many people think that, that if they come to Jesus with their problems, that they are going to find rejection. But that would be going contrary to His very nature. And so we always find acceptance when we come to Jesus. Friend, let me tell you something. Jesus loves you more than anything. And, and we need to just understand that. He loves us more than anything. He does not see you or anyone as an outcast or a lost cause, but as His precious child. 
He wants to give you healing and new life. He wants to get you to have faith in Him. But friends, what you must do to have those things is take a risk of faith. You have to risk it all to have a real relationship with the Master. Let's pray together. Father, I thank You so much today for this time that we've had to gather here to worship You. And Father, I pray for that person who's here today who perhaps has never placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they would say, Lord, I am willing to take that great risk. I'm going to let go of all those things in this life, my reputation, my fears that I have of being found out and discovered for who I am. Because Lord, you know who I really am. And you know that I am a sinner. And you know that I have fallen short of your glory. But Lord, I also know that you sent your Son into the world to go to a cross, to die for my sin, that it might be paid for and taken away. And that he rose from the dead on the third day, getting victory over sin and death. And I thank you that I can have that same victory along with him in my life simply by taking this risk of faith. God, I pray for Christians that are here today that know people that are in some of these same situations here. Father, I pray that we might be like Jesus and that we might extend that same kind of love and acceptance to them so that they might come to know Him as their personal Lord and Savior. God, I pray that You would give us many opportunities to be a blessing to those that we come in contact with day to day as we're out and about and that we might be your chosen servants. And we pray all these things today in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.